Would you please stand in body or spirit as together we join our voices in the call to worship. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Amen. the wondrous cross. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ and welcome to Good Friday worship here at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. Whether you're here in person or on live stream, we pray that this service will create a reverent space for your Holy Week journey. Today's service, which will run around three hours in length, is, yes, a long service. For those of you who are here in person, we do not want you to feel shackled to your seats. Bathrooms can be accessed in the narthex in the back of the sanctuary. All we ask is that if you do wish to exit, please do so during the singing of the hymns. Today's service is lengthy, but it is actually very simple. We will begin by listening as the clergy read the story of Good Friday from the Gospel of Luke. The remainder of the service is composed of seven moments in which we will reflect together on the suffering and death of Jesus. Down through the centuries, Christians of every background and historical time have asked these questions. Why this suffering? Why this 
death. Today, our pastoral staff and seminary interns will do the same. Each of the seven sections in today's service has a hymn, a unison prayer, a choral anthem, a scripture reading, and a homily. Each stage ends with a protracted time of silence. These moments of silence are intentionally lengthy and are meant to give you time to reflect and pray. And in each of these sections, the silence will be broken by a bell. At the close of the service, with the benediction, we invite all of you to return for our Easter Sunday services at 9.30 a.m. here in the sanctuary and at 11.15 also here in the sanctuary and on live stream. We will celebrate the empty tomb with great joy. If you're coming in person, we invite you to bring a few blooms from your garden or for from the local market to flower this cross, which will be outside on Fifth Avenue. Bless you this holy day. Will you please join me in the Collect for Good Friday, which appears in your bulletin and on your screen. It is Friday, Holy One, and we stand at the foot of the cross. Where shall we cast our eyes? We look down, we glance to the side, we stare inward, we look up at him. My God, my God, what does this mean? How is this sacred? How can this save? How is this love? This is a hard place to stand. We want to run away. Yet you, gracious God, bid us stay. So we ask for courage, patience, and calm. Help us to watch and listen and pray. It is Friday, and we stand at the foot of the cross. Hold on to us here. Do not let us go. This we pray in the name name of Jesus, our suffering Lord. Amen. The Passion According to the Gospel of Luke. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to the one whom by he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another, which one of them could it be who could do this? A dispute also arose amongst them as to which one of them would be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, The king of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? 
It is not the one at the table, but I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. He said to them, When I send you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, No, not a thing. He said to them, But now the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag. And the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counting among the lawless, and indeed what is written about me is being fulfilled. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. He replied, It is enough. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who, are, who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers, and of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else, on seeing him, said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man also was with him, for he is a, a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. 
Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? They kept heaping many other insults on him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, gathered together, and they brought him to their council. They said, If you are the Messiah, tell us. He replied, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All of them asked, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, He stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee where he began even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad for he had been wanting to see him for a long time because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then he put an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people, and here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Then they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow, release Barabbas for us. This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed over Jesus as they wished. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. 
Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it's dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. And when all the crowds that had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan of action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one else had been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Please stand as you are able to join us in singing hymn 220, Go to Dark Gethsemane.
please join me in the prayer of unison printed in your bulletin or seen on your screen. Resilient God, the heaviness of today weighs on us. It begs us to ask, why this suffering? Why this path? Meet us in our seeking. Meet us in our grief. Remind us that we are not alone. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Here ends the reading. Friends, we turn toward the cross on this day as our scripture guides us through the last days of Jesus' life and ministry. We remember Christ who suffered at the hands of the empire. We remember Christ who prayed in the garden and Christ who was betrayed. Christ who gave up his life. Christ who taught us until his last and labored breath. This year, asking together, 
Why this suffering? Each of the homilies in today's service will lift up a partial answer as we wonder together, why does Christ suffer? What can we know about Christ and about ourselves through the suffering we are called to witness? And what does Christ's suffering have to do with our atonement? A special church word we use to name our reconciliation with God across the distances of all our human shortcomings made possible through Christ. So you will hear seven different reflections today on Christ's suffering. And there may be some viewpoints that you align with and nod along to. And there may be some homilies that you find something to disagree with or to wrestle with as you listen. And that's okay. Just as you hear your clergy share different theologies from the baptismal font in our time of confession and peace, this is part of the process in this service that we invite you to embrace. We thought together that perhaps we have so many versions of this concept that we call atonement so because of the many theologically rich ways we can answer this question, why? There's no single human theory that can fully explore the why of Christ's suffering on this violent, human-hewn cross. None are fully complete on their own. None are fully right or fully wrong. For as our intern and one of today's preachers, Kari Swanson, has wisely said, when we get to heaven, we are likely to all be just a little bit wrong. And we thank God for that. So with that as our invitation, turn with me to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the depths of Jesus' humanity displayed in his wavering and fear. Our scripture tells us Jesus knows he will be betrayed and denied and soon will die. He knows what lies ahead for him, the pain of a death by torture caught between sin and evil beyond the reach of miracles. But in the garden, in the depths of this night of knowing what lies ahead, Jesus prays. He turns to God whom he calls Father, Abba, a name laden with intimacy and love to express this fear that has him awake in the night. Father, he prays, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Hearing Jesus call God Abba, Father, calls to mind the last words we know are coming. The words that Jesus calls out on the cross at the moment of his darkest pain, the very moment that he breathes his last. Knowing that he will call this plea to Abba, Father, from the cross, it breaks my heart open to hear within this same verse the yielding of Jesus to what he knows awaits him. If you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done, he prays. To me, this verse encompasses the fullness of God's solidarity with our human suffering. Jesus, fully human in his fear and doubting, Christ, fully divine in his willingness to submit to God's will. To be fully human, fully divine, is to know the worst of our human doings and still submit to death still submit to a death by human brutality, submit to execution of an innocent man, to still say, yes, if it is your will, God, to a suffering we can point to and say, if God was there in that, God must be here with me in this. Whatever 
you are carrying with you into this service this year. Whatever suffering or longing, whatever time in your life this year you have lifted up this same question, take this cup from me, Father. You are not alone in that human wondering, that wanting. For our suffering, Lord, suffers with us. Our ultimate teacher of solidarity, of presence alongside us, wanting both to be spared and submitting to see it through to the fullness of God's will. There is no sorrow, no suffering. God has not looked in the eye to witness fully and said, yes, we can go there together. We are reconciled to God through this. Through God's presence with us in the darkest nights of our souls, when we cry out over and over and over again and wait to hear the response of God. Jesus, too, is waiting. In the darkness of the garden, calling out to Abba, we don't get to hear the answer. We see instead an angel who visits Jesus to give him strength but the anguish he feels is not lifted. Instead, he prays so deeply that his body begins to weep with sweat. He is working at this prayer. I imagine him repeating his plea, take this cup from me, but following it always, always with his obedience to God, yet if it is your will be done. So too, we might not hear from God in the depths of our suffering nights. But we can hope that God will send us angels to give us strength to be with us in our human longing to say, I hear you, I see you in your anguish. From the baptismal font, you hear me say, because Christ lives, we live. Because Christ bore wounds, our wounds too are not rejected or ignored. I say this to each of you as a reminder that death does not have the last word over us. Suffering does not have the last word over us. And I say it as an invitation to love our imperfections also, to love our doubting, to love ourselves even when we ask God to lift this suffering from us. For it is a wounded Christ, a questioning Christ, a Christ who longs to hear an answered prayer. This is the Christ who meets us at the font of our baptism we who are wounded and we who are responsible for creating wounds. It is Christ who fills the gaps between us and God. Jesus, so human as to die, Christ who fully knows the depths of our suffering, knows our desires to be elsewhere, to feel not this, to want to hear the voice of God saying, okay, we will make another way. Yes, there is a way to live fully without this suffering. But we know this cannot be. We cannot know the heights of our happiness and joy without opening also to the depths of our human blundering and illness and injury and disappointment. We don't get the exuberance of Easter's resurrection morning without this day. So even when we can't 
hear God answering us back. We remember the angels sent from heaven to accompany Jesus in his doubt. We remember that we too can hear each other in the silences left by God. Recently, a member here came up to me this fall after worship in the sanctuary to tell me about their first experience worshiping from home online. Through tears, they described that they'd been in a season of some dark and raw emotion, and they found it really hard to sit through a service without weeping. And they said, when we pass the peace to the folks online, they said, I know I'm not alone. I was free to cry, to weep as much as I needed, and I still felt my church was with me at home. Even on the days when we can't hear God, we can sit in the garden together, bring each other strength, be with each other in prayer, remind each other that God is here even in God's silence. Will you listen with me for that still, small voice? Will you speak that needed word aloud to the one you know is hurting? Amen.
the last teaching. Please join me in the unison prayer printed in your bulletin or on your screen. Resilient God, the heaviness of today weighs on us. It begs us ask, why this suffering? Why this pain? Meet us in our seeking. Meet us in our grief. Remind us that we are not alone. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 15. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Here ends the reading. In the Gospel of John, we get to hear Jesus say goodbye. His goodbye is long. As he washes the disciples' feet, offers final words of encouragement and praise. In every piece of this goodbye, it seems like Jesus is trying to say more than anything else. I love you. Love one another. I love you. Love one another. The poet Maggie Smith has a work about loving the world called Rain, New Year's Eve. She talks about how her daughter knows that loving the world means loving the wobbles you can't shim, 
the creeks you can't oil silent, the jerry-rigged parts, MacGyvered with twine and chewing gum. Then she moves into a sort of prayer. Let me love the world the way I love my young son, not only when he cups my face in his sticky hands, but when roughhousing, he accidentally splits my lip. Let me love the world like a mother. Let me be tender when it lets me down. Now, I don't know if Maggie Smith thought at all about God when she wrote these words, but when I read the ending, let me love the world like a mother. Let me be tender when it lets me down. It is a prayer that I might love the world as God has loved me. As John puts it at the very beginning of his gospel story, Jesus put on flesh and dwelled among us. He came close, close enough to feel our sticky hands cupping his face. He came close enough that we might, when roughhousing, split his lip. Jesus lived a life of coming close so that we might know the joy of being loved and so that we might know the joy of loving. Jesus shows us that the way of love is not without pain or suffering. We cannot love without coming close, and when we come close, we are always close enough to hurt. To love is to come close, and Jesus loved the world so much, loved people, so much that he would suffer the worst of us and say, I will love you still. Toward the beginning of his goodbye, Jesus tells his disciples that they cannot come where he is going. Upset, Peter asks Jesus where he's going. And Jesus answers, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And Peter asks, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. I love Peter for that. I think he's earnest. I think he wants to mean it. And I think he knows that there is no greater love than laying down his life. He has listened to Jesus, his teacher, his friend. He knows that his call is to walk the way of love. And yet, he can't do it. He will not lay down his life for Jesus, but he will deny him three times. In the face of terror and oppression, Peter is understandably scared. Peter pulls away. But in the face of terror and oppression, Jesus is steadfast in his love for the world. Jesus stays close. Jesus loves to the end. I wonder if when Jesus tells Peter where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. If he's not talking about the cross or about death, at least not exactly, I wonder if where Jesus is going is the furthest end of love. Peter has walked with Jesus and learned how to walk the way of love. He already knows it in the abstract. He utters the words, Lord, I will lay down my life for you, before Jesus tells the apostles that we have no greater love than to lay down our life for our friends. But in order to actually go to the fullest extent of love, 
Peter has to receive the fullest extent of love. The furthest end of love is not without sorrow or pain. The way of love is a hard way to walk. So Jesus tells Peter, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. And then he shows him. Here is how you love the world. You stay close. You stay tender, even when it lets you down. I like to think that Jesus is proud of Peter at the end, that he knows Peter will have the courage to draw close again, that he knows Peter will keep walking toward the fullest end of love. After Jesus shows us how to do it, Peter will be able to do it too. We all will. When Jesus says goodbye, he says, I love you, love one another. When Jesus suffers and dies, he shows us that this love is not only worth the risk, this love is worth the cost. The Betrayal and Arrest of Jesus.
Family of Faith, join me in the unison prayer printed in your bulletin and visible on your screen. Resilient God, the heaviness of today weighs on us. It begs us ask, why this suffering? Why this path? Meet us in our seeking. Meet us in our grief. Remind us that we are not alone. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 47 through 53. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him. Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I was a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. 
Here ends the reading. Every year we come to this sanctuary on Good Friday to hear the story of the crucifixion. And many of us cannot help but ask ourselves, why did this have to happen in the first place? Why this cross? Why Christ's suffering? As Natalie said earlier, theologians have spent forever trying to wrap their mind around this question. And while there are many great theories, no single answer stands alone in perfect clarity. Instead, the, the theories are more like pieces of a pie. You get different flavors and wisdom with every slice. So the job for us preachers today is to ask ourselves this question, why this suffering? Why the crucifixion? And when I do that, when I really reflect on this day, there are two answers that come to mind. One, because we are human. And two, because God is love. The text I just read starts with Jesus in the garden. Scripture tells us that after the Last Supper, Jesus invites the disciples to go to the Mount of Olives to pray. And it's there in the midst of the gnarled olive trees and the moonlight that Judas appears with a crowd. I've always pictured this moment it's kind of like a biblical West Side story. The sharks versus the jets. The disciples versus the crowd. Judas arrives with a posse. He kisses Jesus on the cheek and then all hell breaks loose. The disciples ask, Lord, should we strike with the sword? This moment in the text feels so painfully human to me. For after years by Jesus' side, the disciples still don't get it. You would think that by now, the disciples might have learned to respond in another way. That they might have learned to respond with grace or empathy, with compassion or gentleness. But instead, the disciples face the crowd and their first question is, should we strike? It leaves someone bleeding. So, why this suffering? I think part of the answer is because we are human. The text makes it clear that we humans can be quick to forget that we belong to one another. Like the disciples in the garden, we are quick to draw our swords, quick to create dividing lines, quick to point fingers. Just look at the news. You'll see it all over the place. Some argue that this human proclivity towards violence and othering is the linchpin in this day. Some folks follow the scapegoat theory of atonement, which says that Jesus was a victim to an angry mob that chose violence, and that's why we have this suffering. Now, I do think our human nature plays a part in this equation, but I don't think it's the only part. Fortunately, I think God was up to something much bigger than that. When Judas entered the garden and things turned violent, Jesus demonstrated another way. Jesus cried out, no more of this. And then with gentle intimacy, Jesus reached out and healed the one who was hurt. He crossed the dividing line. We see this pattern over and over again on this Good Friday. From the foot washing all the way to Jesus' last breath, Jesus moves through the violence of this day with compassion and grace, mercy and love. He forgives the criminal on the cross next to him. 
He turns to see Peter when Peter denies. He heals the one who is wounded in the garden. He washes his betrayer's feet. The Gospel of John describes this pattern by saying, Jesus loved them to the very end. And I think that kind of resilient love transforms us. So yet again, we ask, why this suffering? And this time I would say, sure, it is partly because we humans have proclivity towards division. However, I think that even more than that, a bigger part of that is rooted in God's love. For until Jesus took his last breath, until the very end, he was going to show us another way. He was going to choose love even on the worst day. And that example, that love, it saves us. It reminds me of a scene from the book Bel Canto by Ann Patchett. In the first chapter of that book, a dinner party full of political leaders, world delegates, and famous performers are taken hostage. Right in the middle of dessert, the power is cut off. Before the vice president and global ambassadors can realize what is happening, the walls are lined with militiamen carrying rifles. One of the guests taken hostage was unlike the others and that he wasn't particularly important. He wasn't a delegate or a politician, but he was a Christian. His name was Father Arguedas. He was a young Catholic priest. At some point in the takeover, the young priest realized that the militia warriors lining the walls were not grown men. He realized with a closer look that most of their captors were kids, teenagers carrying guns, led by a few angry generals. As the hostage situation dragged on, the young priest watched those teenagers struggle with exhaustion. The hostages were forced to lie on the floor, but their captors were forced to stand guard over them. So after a few days, the warrior's eyes hung heavy. From his position lying on the ground, Father Arguedas noticed that many of those gun-carrying teens began to slide down the walls they were leaning against, knees buckling in exhaustion, bodies slumping over their guns. After a while, Father Arguedas caught the eye of one of the soldiers nearest him. He called to him. He whispered, son, and patted the floor beside him. The boy blinked slowly, tightening his grip on his gun, shaking his head, surprised by the term of endearment from one he held hostage. But the priest whispered again, Come and rest, patting the floor beside him. The boy looked around nervously and then mouthed, I'm not allowed. But the priest, insisting on compassion and crossing dividing lines, whispered again, I say that you are. Eventually, the scene ends with the young warrior refusing, tears in his eyes. But the young priest promises that in a few hours he will offer again. He would offer, he said, because he needed that boy to know that even here, even now, there was a place to rest and the forgiveness of sins. Friends, Love in the face of violence is transformative. The compassion offered by that young priest to the guerrilla warrior holding him hostage changed their relationship. 
Bit by bit, it broke down the dividing wall between the hostages and their captors until genuine care was established, not only between the two of them, but throughout the room. And that's what we see Jesus doing on Good Friday. Instead of patting the floor and telling a soldier to come and rest, he pats his face and tells him that he is healed. He shows compassion when we show fear. He responds to violence with nonviolence. He chooses love when the world chooses division. And that example is transformative. That example, it saves us. So while it is never easy for us on this day to answer the question, why this suffering? The answer for me has something to do with our humanity and a whole lot more to do with God's desire to love us until the end. It's just one piece of the pie, but it's transformative. So may we find rest in that. Amen. for he is our peace.
please join me in the unison prayer. Resilient God, the heaviness of today weighs on us. It begs us ask, why this suffering? Why this path? Meet us in our seeking. Meet us in our grief. Remind us that we are not alone. Amen. A reading from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. Here ends the reading. Good afternoon, church. Thank you. <laughs> when I first sat on these cushy chairs, I felt like I was sitting in business class on our worship ark to heaven. <laughs> then I got up to this pulpit and realized that this may be the height from which Jesus saw us from the cross. Would you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've been thinking about farewells this month, goodbyes on earth and to heaven. I miss them and I regret not loving them more when they were with me. As there is nothing I can do now, I stand at the foot of the cross with Mary and the beloved disciple. The cross consoles me. On days I feel too weak to follow the path of perfect love that Jesus has shown us, I need God to hold me. Nothing conveys me God's love from as viscerally as the cross. Jesus underwent excruciating humiliation with physical and psychological pain. All his disciples, even the one who swore would follow him to death, abandoned him. His life expired breath by breath, drop by drop, every breath and every drop for each one of us. During the recent FIA membership class, Pastor Sarah taught us that we Presbyterians have an empty cross like this one to emphasize resurrection. I nodded then, as minimalism is my preferred aesthetic. But when my heart aches, I need to see Jesus on the cross. My soul, when it is tender, resonates more with the crucifix as seen in Catholic churches. As a child, I used to fear seeing the crucifix in our living room. At night, I would cover my eyes and walk with my gaze down to avoid eye contact with Jesus on the cross. But now I'm grateful for the visual reminder that God suffers with us. I can believe that nothing can separate us from the love of God through Jesus who asks for the forgiveness of those who crucified him. The incarnate God suffered rejection by family, betrayal by friends, and travesty of justice by kings and priests. The enfleshed God on trial seemed as helpless as a baby in a manger. Yet even till his last breath, Jesus embraces us with his outstretched arms. Jesus knows our wounds as he covers us with his pierced hands. Ephesians 2.13 tells us that the blood of Christ has brought us closer. Ephesians 2.14 tells us that the flesh of Christ has made us one body. While this Ephesians passage is referring to Jews and Gentiles, I believe the cross also reconciles all who are estranged, whether in life as we may desire, or after death, if that be God's will. Scholars have noted that Ephesians has an accent on the present compared to the other epistles of Paul. Whereas salvation permeates the world with the future return of Christ in uh, Paul's other letters, salvation is already imminent in Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 5 and 6 urge us that by grace you have been saved and that God has already raised us up with Jesus and seated us with God. In Ephesians, the atonement of Christ for our sins has been consummated. On my blue days, I need to taste the salvation 
here and now. Here and now, I invite you to lay before the cross all your burdens. Then until we regather on Easter, I invite you to reminisce upon those with whom we will reunite in heaven. March daffodils evoke for me the memories of my grandpa who passed away two springs ago. He was the only grandpa I knew because the Korean War took my other grandpa. He was the patriarch of my family who loved me and taught me in ways that only he could. He was the deepest root of my life. Along with patriarchs like Abraham, I will see my two grandpas in heaven. And until then, I can only hope my life brings them smiles. The cross for me is the liminal space between life and death. I see reflected on it the faces of those whom I love. Through the flesh of Christ that transfigures our violence, peace can blossom around the cross. Through the blood of Christ that sanctifies our passion, compassion can blossom around the cross. And I see beyond the cosmic cross the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the first fruit of all our resurrection, who brings us nearer to all the saints across time and space. So thanks be to God for the crown on the cross, for his arms that make us one. Amen.
the crucifixion of Jesus. Will you please join me in singing hymn 217. Please join me in the unison prayer that's in your bulletin or on your screen. Resilient God, the heaviness of today weighs on us. It begs us ask, why this suffering? Why this path? Meet us in our seeking. Meet us in our grief. Remind us that we are not alone. Amen. You may be seated.
A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with Jesus. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on the right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide Jesus' clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Messiah of God, he's his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Here ends the reading. For those of you who know me as a pastor, you have heard me often say, you are loved and you are enough. So if you're asking yourself, is Warner going to do another you are loved and you're enough sermon? You betcha. (laughs) The odds were definitely in your favor. (laughs) Now, what you need to know is that I don't say this to have a tagline. I say it because I fundamentally believe that this is at the heart of the Christian message. Throughout the scriptures, in God's love for God's creation, and in the person of Jesus, we are constantly being reminded that we are loved, and through the grace of God, we are enough. We got this reminder last night at Christ's table. We get this reminder today at Jesus' death. And we will get this reminder on Easter Sunday at Jesus' resurrection. You are loved and you are enough. When I go out to coffee with some of you and we have this conversation, we're talking about you're loved and you're enough, and often two questions come to mind. First one is usually one of gratitude, one for the reminder that you truly are loved and enough. And I say this a lot because often we forget We often believe the lies that tell us that we are not enough. We often measure our worth by what high school or college we got into, or what time we got on that swim meet, or by our performance reviews at work, by how much money is in our bank account, or if our bodies are working correctly. And when something is off, we believe the lie that we are not enough. So in conversations with you all, Sometimes there is gratitude for the reminder. You are loved. You are enough. The second conversation point, you often ask this question. Now, I know you believe that I am loved and enough, but do you really believe that about enter the name of your most hated politician? The short answer is, yes, I do. And that is a truth that we don't like to admit. We all have people on our list, and you know what list I'm talking about. The list of people that for one reason or another, we do not like. Perhaps it's because this person really did you dirty and stole a job from you. Or perhaps they made you feel so insignificant with cruel words. Or perhaps... It's the mean and hateful rhetoric and actions that your most hated politicians say. Perhaps it's simply the way they look. It's just something about them. Or perhaps it's even worse. There is something a person did that you can never forgive them for. Do I still believe that that person is loved and enough? I do. Suddenly that message isn't so nice and cozy anymore, but it's a lot more scandalous. A professor of mine from seminary described what Jesus does on the cross as the scandal of the cross. She went on to tell the class that she believes that two things happened at the same time on the cross. One, that Christ identifies with the oppressed and the hurting and empathizes with them because he too felt pain and shame in his body and on the cross. 
and in victory over sin, there are steps towards real healing and redemption for those who hurt. But here's the scandalous part, that at the same time, Christ forgives the offender of the oppressed. And in victory over sin, there are steps towards real healing and redemption for those who oppress. Ugh. I don't know if I like that. A Christ that identifies with our pain, a Christ that wants to remove shame, a Christ that saves us and redeems me and calls me loved and enough, I can get behind that. But a Christ that does the very same thing for that person, I don't want that. I hate that person. I don't want to see redemption there. Jesus, pick a freaking side. Are you on my side or their side? My professor went on to give another truth bomb that really hurt. We have each been the one whom Christ has empathized with and the oppressor who Christ forgives. Is she really talking about me? If I do an honest assessment on myself, I know it's true. In fits of rage, I have said some really hurtful things to people. I, at times, have hateful feelings in my heart and have prejudiced thoughts. I rarely actually take revenge, but my revenge fantasies are so vivid in my mind. I have been the oppressor because I have looked people in the eye and saw an ugly face instead of a beloved child of God. What Christ does on the cross by conquering sin is redemption and healing of brokenness of our own pain and shame that has been done to us, but also that we have done. On the cross, Christ identifies with our hurt and at the same time forgives us for our own offenses. Christ on the cross is with the middle school boy who is dealing with bullying at school. Christ on the cross empathizes with the real torture that human beings around the world are dealing with in this moment because people do not see them as human. Christ on the cross empathizes with the pain of shame. But Christ does not only empathize, but also redeems and tells a different and better story. Christ tells the hurting that although it feels like the world has forgotten about you, I have not forgotten about you. I'm in the process of redeeming and healing. Christ brings hope to hopeless places. Yet the other thing that Christ did on the cross and resurrection is just as important and redemptive. Not only does Christ understand our pain and suffering, but Christ also takes on our offenses with him at the cross. Christ understands the hardship of the oppressed on the cross, but also forgives the offender as well, which includes our own offenses. So Christ, which side are you on? Are you on the side of those who hold hardship or are you on the side of forgiving those who hurt others? I think Jesus would say, I'm on the side of redemption. That is why we remind you each week at the confessional sequence that you are forgiven, you are loved, and you are enough. God isn't bloodthirsty. God wants to redeem and heal. On Ash Wednesday, I was right outside these doors on Fifth Avenue, giving ashes on the street. And one guy mistook me for a Catholic priest and said, I need a blessing, Father. I did some real messed up stuff last night. But I saw the pain in his face, and I prayed for him. He didn't want a free pass for what he did. He needed to know that he was still worthy of redemption. I don't know what he did. He didn't elaborate. Heck, he could have been that guy that I hated. But what is true for him is what's true for me and what is true for you. 
that in Christ you are worthy of redemption. The cross is scandalous, but it's also a gift. The people on my list, when I think about them, I lose hope, I get bitter, I get angry, and I want to fight. Yet when I remember that through Christ they are also loved and enough, I can see them as redeemable. And there is a certain weight lifted off my shoulder. So friends, know this gospel truth, this assurance of pardon, that Christ knows your pain, knows what you're dealing with, knows your shame, and also knows your sin. But Jesus on the cross and in his body has taken your pain, your shame, and your sin and brings redemption so that you might be dead to sin, but alive to all that is good. Hear the good news of the gospel. In Christ, you are forgiven, you are deeply loved, and you are enough. Amen.
the death of Jesus. Please rise and join me in singing hymn number 213. Please join me in the unison prayer printed in your bulletin or on the screen. Resilient God, the heaviness of today weighs on us. It begs us ask, why this suffering? Why this path? Meet us in our seeking. Meet us in our grief. Remind us that we are not alone. Amen. You may be seated.
A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Here ends the reading. Friday was ending, and Joseph, a Pharisee of the highest order, painstakingly took the dead body of Jesus off the cross. He wrapped Jesus in cloth and placed him in a tomb. They said this man promised an eternal kingdom of peace, hope, and life. I can imagine Joseph thinking. Friday was ending and a group of women started sorting spices for the body of their son, their friend, the one they loved. Oh, how their fingers steadfastly moved, sorting the spices as their minds were left trying to grasp the incomprehensible fact that life would never be the same. The sure tears flowed as they wondered, why? I can imagine them recalling all the people he healed, all the meals they ate together, the laughs they shared, the miraculous, remarkable things they witnessed. Yet, they sorted the spices and ointment to be placed on his body. I can only imagine how many questions Joseph and the women had amid their despair. How hard it must have been to grip their minds around the death of a man they believed so wholeheartedly. I'm sure they were asking really hard questions with no easy answers. When we think about the death of Jesus and why it matters for us, there are few easy answers. We know this event is important, it's life-changing, and so these hard questions are faithful ones. Shouldn't they have an easy answer? Why is this event, which is so vital for our faith and our life, shrouded in so much mystery and grief? As you've heard others say, scholars, academics, and people of faith have been asking what the death of Jesus means for hundreds and thousands of years. There are hundreds and thousands of books and thoughts recorded to prove it. Why did Jesus' death happen this way? Why a cross? Did it have to be in a Roman-occupied Palestine? Do I want to believe in a God that sacrifices God's own son? Does this bring us salvation? What is salvation? Why this suffering of Jesus? And once the questions start coming, they are hard to stop. I remember one of the first times I realized how many questions our faith produced. I was in the car with my dad, maybe seven or eight years old, and we were talking about God. My dad, who was a pastor and a medical doctor, seemed to know the answer to every Bible question or anything I could ever wonder about God. 
But in the car that day, he said, I can't wait to ask God my long list of questions one day. Our conversation had sparked a question that had caused him to lengthen this theoretical list. I remember being surprised that my dad didn't have an answer. Didn't belief mean no more questions or doubts? Now in seminary, I can only wish that was the case. Questions are a common part of our faith, a close companion. And questions about Jesus are something we share with Joseph and the women at the end of our Good Friday story. Joseph and the women, having just witnessed their friend and teacher murdered as a criminal, were filled with questions, I'm sure. And how could they not be? These questions matter when we are faced with impossible situations of grief, confusion, anger, and despair. Moments when what we believe is what we cling to for our lives. I can't help but imagine they were asking, why did this happen, Jesus? You were supposed to save us, Jesus. You weren't supposed to die, Jesus. You were our hope. Jesus, how do I go on, Jesus? It is hard to look at Good Friday and find answers when we leave out Easter morning, when we are only left with so many questions. But this moment, this snapshot of people caring for the body of the one who loved them, who they loved, is an achingly beautiful picture of perhaps an answer to that why. What do we do when we don't know that Sunday is coming? When there seems to be no clear answer to our questions about Jesus, about God, or the cruel conditions of life and humanity that threaten to overpower us. A few weeks ago, I stopped in for office hours with one of my seminary professors. Coincidentally, I am currently taking a class that is all about who Jesus is and why it matters for us. I had two questions for him. The first one was about a recent reading that I did not understand, and the other was about this text, Why the Suffering of Jesus. As I sat down in his office, surrounded by books and years of theological wisdom, he told me, your first question is easy. I have an answer for that reading. Your second question, why does Jesus' death on the cross matter? And what was it for? Now that is a much harder question that I don't have an answer for. And yet, as we sat and talked about Joseph, the women, their grief and hopelessness, and their acts following Jesus' death, I left my professor's office with a stronger sense of hope, of life and love, than when I had first entered. Because these faithful followers and friends of Jesus also did not know the why but they knew Jesus' love. They knew who was being talked about when we say, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Jesus was the son sent from love, out of love, to love people, to love the world. Their acts after Jesus' death are filled with love and honor. Joseph risked his position as an elite council member within Jewish society by asking for the body of a criminal, Jesus, from Pontius Pilate. He made sure Jesus' body was taken off the cross and buried in a tomb on the day of death 
according to the Jewish burial customs, because that is what you do for your people after death. And the women who dutifully prepared burial spices amid their tears and sorrows and questions, who were going to make sure that the body was ready according to custom and to tradition as soon as possible. They loved amidst their questions and grief, even when they did not know that Sunday was coming. Friday was ending and Joseph and these women loved so fiercely, even though all hope had been lost, even though their list of questions was endless. They loved Jesus because Jesus loved them. The space in which our biggest whys reside can often feel like a desolate, hope-ridden, confusing place. But these few hours after the death of Jesus depict question-ridden spaces as places of deep faith. Asking why is a faithful question. In that why, like Joseph and these women, we know that Jesus loves. When only questions existed, they loved because the man loved them so well. For God so loved the world, for Christ so loved the people, for we too love. So my friends, why did Jesus suffer? I'm afraid to admit that I don't have an easy answer for you. But this I do know. When we can bring all our questions, those oh-so-faithful doubts, when things don't seem to make any sense, when there seems to be too much mystery for our own good, know that you have been loved so fiercely all the way to death on a cross. And so we love because of it. We wrap the body, we prepare the spices, for Sunday is coming, and hope will fill our question-ridden space once more. Amen. covered by the blood. Please rise in body or in spirit as we sing him 221, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded.
Join me in the unison prayer found in your bulletin and on your screens. Resilient God, the heaviness of today weighs on us. It begs us ask, why this suffering? Why this path? Meet us in our seeking. Meet us in our grief. Remind us that we are not alone. Amen. Please be seated.
a reading from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Here ends the reading. For believers, the cross is a symbol of love and hope. People wear it and look to it to remember the way God gave God's only son out of love for us and how Jesus defeated death. Jesus' death on the cross was so triumphant that culturally speaking, most people have forgotten that the cross was an instrument of torture and death. Some of us know all too well the bloody, guilt-driven, and dare I say even manipulative way this understanding of atonement might be. And cognizant of this, I humbly share why I believe Jesus had to suffer. Paul's letter to the Romans identifies sin as the problem that has afflicted the world in a terrible way. For me, it establishes two truths, of sin that is. First, the penalty of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. And second, every person, no one excluded, is guilty of sin. The way that we emphasize all are welcome, all have sinned, Romans 3, 23. Well, this poses a problem for God because God created humans and loves them. One of the first stories about humanity in the Bible captures this tension. It is the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They are allowed to eat from every tree in the garden except for one particular tree. They obey for a while, but end up eating the fruit from the forbidden tree. They sin. Their eyes are opened. They realize that they are naked. They cover themselves with fig leaves, and they try to hide from God. So what happens? They are supposed to die. Yet rather than killing off humanity due to their transgression so early on, God finds a solution. God clothes them. God covers their nakedness. Weren't they already clothed with fig leaves? Yes, they were. But God takes an extra step in making garments of skin for them, clothing them. God covers their nakedness. God covers their shame. But in order to do this, something has to die. Animals. People sin. God loves people. God forgives, but something has to die. That sounds weird, but because we know that the penalty of sin is death, it brings us to the scripture passage that I read to start this homily. The only thing that can atone for sin is blood. Forgiveness depends on it. As much as God is almighty and sovereign, God upholds justice, must uphold it, due to God's character. Justice for sin demands blood. Here is a quick and rough sketch of sacrifice in biblical history. When the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, God sent Moses to deliver them. Through a series of ten signs or plagues, God convinces Pharaoh to let God's people go. 
for the last plague, God would send the angel of death through all Egypt to kill the firstborn of every living person and animal. The only way to prevent this from happening is to paint the blood from a sacrificed, blemishless lamb on the doorposts of the home. Upon seeing the blood, the angel of death would pass over the home, hence the origin of the celebration of the Passover. After being set free from Egypt, a system of sacrifice is implemented in Israel, centering on the time when once a year, the high priest enters into the Holy of Holies to offer a perfect, blemishless sacrifice for the atonement of sins for all the people. The Holy of Holies was the room in the tabernacle and temple containing the Ark of the Covenant where God is believed to physically reside. This system continued until in the fullness of time, Jesus came from heaven to earth. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a human mother. Jesus was God. Jesus was human. Jesus was not half God and half human. Jesus was 100% God and 100% human. Christians, through the power of the Holy Spirit, affirm this mystery. Jesus needs to be God because only God can forgive sin and has the power to save. Jesus needs to be human in order to relate with us, in order to take our place. Without both of these conditions met, Jesus could not save us. On his time on earth, as a human being, as one of us, Jesus lived a sinless life life. He lived a perfect, blemishless life. Yet this sinless, innocent human being was mocked, betrayed, falsely accused, and condemned to a punishment that was reserved for only the worst of criminals. As the Son of God, at any time, Jesus could have called upon the angels of heaven to put a stop to the false arrest and force of a trial, but he did not. Instead, he willingly received the scourging and torture before going to the cross upon which he was nailed and lifted up in order that he might die a slow and excruciating death. On Good Friday, Jesus, the Son of God, died. Jesus, having died, Jesus went to hell. Because this sounds so bizarre, let me reframe the definition of hell as a place marked by the absence of God. The absence of God. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, who has only and forever known perfect communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit, is for the first time in eternity separated from the others. Not only separated, abandoned. God's back is turned on Jesus. So why? Why did Jesus have to suffer? Like the way God covered the nakedness and shame of Adam and Eve, God sent Jesus to cover our sin. The price of clothing them was the death of an animal. The price of clothing us was Jesus. Like the Passover lamb, Jesus is the perfect, blemishless sacrifice. His blood is all that the angel of death needs to see for him to pass us over. In order to die in our place, Jesus gives up the riches and glories of heaven and becomes one of us, a human. He enters our world, 
becomes familiar with pain, betrayal, loss, joy, love, and all the other experiences that makes us human. Like the high priest offers a sacrifice on behalf of the people, Jesus offers himself up as the sacrifice on behalf of the people. Being a perfect, blemishless sacrifice, God accepts the sacrifice and forgives the sin. In addition, because it is Jesus and not a sinful human who is the high priest who offers it up, and because it is Jesus' blood and not an animal's blood that gets spilled, the sacrifice is once and for all. No more need for animal sacrifices. Further, the curtain in the temple that was torn from top to bottom refers to the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Some of us experienced that at the Maundy Thursday service during the strepitus. The high priest was only allowed to enter the holy of holies, that is the direct presence of God, once a year on behalf of the people. By tearing the curtain... Jesus provides direct access to God at any time. On the cross, Jesus becomes the sin of all humanity, past, present, and future. Jesus becomes that which he despises so that justice can be fulfilled. In doing so, Jesus experiences the rejection by God which was meant for us. The cross is the instrument through which God allows for all this to happen. It is the means by which God satisfies justice by dealing with the penalty of sin. It is the means by which God restores humanity's relationship with God. It is the means by which God demonstrates God's love for us once and for all. All of this is done because of our sin all of this is done because God loves us. Through the cross, Jesus covers our nakedness. Jesus covers our shame so that it cannot be seen. All that is seen by God is the blood of the perfect Lamb of God. Jesus' perfect life is credited to us through faith. There is nothing that needs to be done by us because Jesus has done it all. We need only to believe. Thanks be to God for the kaleidoscope of perspectives we have heard to help understand why Jesus had to suffer. As you have heard, not one answers all of it, but maybe seven different perspectives, or go ahead and read those thousands out there that you heard about, and put together your understanding of why God had to suffer. But we understand together as a faith family community some of these perspectives as we have journeyed through Good Friday together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
After today's service, you are welcome to remain in this space for a time of silent reflection and prayer. You are also invited to return here on Easter Sunday at 9.30 or 11.15 in person or online for the proper conclusion of these services that began yesterday on Monday Thursday. Friends, remember that Christ is with us in the dark place. You might feel alone, but know you are not alone. May you go from this place, not in fear, but in hope, looking and watching for the promised return of the light. Amen.